This week, the wraps come off the astonishing Aston Martin Vantage at the Detroit show. Howard Stableford tries out gas propulsion with this bi-fuel Volvo, while we report on an alliance which will accelerate fuel cell development. Plus news on how you could spend a day with the Arrows Formula One team, winning an exclusive MotorWeek competition. Well, I may not quite be the latest Bond Girl material, but Terry Hatcher, you can eat your heart out because I'm about to get a sneak preview of the car that could well be James Bond's latest set of wheels. So what is it? Well, its name is the Vantage and it's an Aston Martin. And if there's any justice at all in this world, this should be the car that lures James Bond away from the Germans and back behind the wheel of what after all is traditionally his favorite mark. From first glance, it seems to me to have so much heritage. It's really evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Is that what you're trying to do? Is the mark very important to you? Yeah, we've tried to take some of the classic Aston themes and refresh them and restate them in, in, a, in a modern way. And I'm glad you think we've succeeded. You're obviously working in a close partnership with Ford. And how much of their technology will go into this? Because it's a fast, high-performance thing, isn't it? Yeah, but we're not going to make it. We had, this is a concept and we're going to use it as a rolling laboratory. But the answer to your question is Ford have helped us tremendously. Um, we already work on the DB7 with Ford in the area of electronics, composite materials, engine uh, and gearbox. So we get a tremendous amount of support. What Ford get is that we can demonstrate technology on a car which is low volume and sells worldwide. So if you like, we can be a technology demonstrator for them. So it's a good partnership. I'm sorry, it's a good partnership. No, it is, it's important. So what about some of the statistics then? Because this is, it's a real high performance vehicle, isn't it? Well, we haven't driven it that hard yet. Um, and we've done very few miles. But what we can do, because we've got very good software, is that we can predict this car will exceed 200 miles an hour and the 0 to 60 time will be around four seconds. Standing quarter in about, uh, well, I don't know, exit the standing quarter at 140 miles an hour. So it should be quick enough for most of our customers. There's a very strong motorsport influence there, and I believe that Jackie Stewart's Grand Prix team have been involved along the way. Is that true? Well, the technology we share, the main technology is probably the, uh, the paddle shift. So you can actually change gear by working paddles on the steering wheel without taking a hand off the wheel. So it's good for safety as well as for very fast gear changes. This is a big boy's toy, isn't it, Bob? <laughs> <clears throat> to some degree, all Astons are big boy's toys in the sense that uh, they're for people who are successful, who are modern, who are international, and, and who love quality things. So, yes, if you want to describe it that way, yes. Of course, one of the real British icons who loves his big boy's toys is James Bond. Do you think this could be the car that would lure him back into an Aston? Which is, come on, it's what he belongs in, really, isn't it? I'd love to... Uh, for him to drive this car in the next Bond film, but uh, we'll have to see. Would you let him drive the concept? Well, if the price was right, I guess we'd have to. James Bond, if you don't take that offer up, you must be absolutely mad. And what a job to be faced with, though, designing a, a new vehicle for Aston Martin. Isn't that like, incredibly daunting to a designer? Or is it like the exciting dream job? It's both, really. I mean, it's extremely daunting because you have a huge responsibility. It's got to be right. You know, you, you can't blow it. It's got to be absolutely right. And the chance to design cars like this happens so, so seldom that um, you have to make the most of it, but it's extremely exciting. I mean, to, to get the job to design a two-seater sports car is every, every designer's dream, it's every schoolboy's dream. And when you get the chance to do it, it's a wonderful feeling. But you have to work very, very hard at it, because, uh, as I say, it, at the end of the day, um, you have to portray the spirit that you feel when you're actually producing it, and it's so easy to lose that. So it's, uh... There's so much talk today about cars being designed by computer, it's all high-tech. I mean, how much of that is really true? Or does it come from within and it's inspirations from around you or the heritage of the mark? Well, I mean, we use computers an awful lot in the process of designing cars, but the spirit of any design has to come from the designer, it has to come from the heart and the mind, it has to come from the influences, it has to come from the heritage of the car itself. So the computers, I say, it's used very much as a tool, it's a means to an end. And we do use a computer for, for verification, we use it for, for clarifying some of the digitised surfaces, etc. But the initial sketches that we do are pencil and paper. And sometimes in the back of a, you know, an envelope. I mean, it literally is that pure. Can I have one? <laughs> one of the cars or one of the sketches? One of the, one of the sketches will do. <laughs> I don't know where they've all gone. They seem to disappear into the ether after a while. We've got about three left, I think. 
Um, you were very yeah. lucky because you, you created the DB7 as well, yes. which is a stunning, yes. you know, wonderful, and has yes. been a great success story. Yes. What about something like this where it's a concept and everybody say, oh, it's not going to be made, it's, you know, it could look like this, it couldn't. Is there a bit of, you know, you obviously would love to see this vehicle go into production. Absolutely, but there's no plan at the moment to make it. What I've got to do is to make it so irresistible that somewhere along the line, somebody turn around and say, yes, let's make this. But at the moment, there are no plans. When we design the car, I design a car very much from a pragmatic point of view. I mean, it's a very emotive thing, but I got to understand how it's going to be made, um, the, roughly the volumes a car like this would be made in. So it's very important that um, I design it in a way, from my point of view, much as anything else, I know it's going to work. This car, for instance, is completely legal. Uh, whereas a lot of show cars, you could actually find areas where they're illegal. So just details like that, and also the construction of this car is very important. We know how it's uh, put together. It's got a very advanced uh, process of, of, of construct chassis construction, mm -hmm. suspension construction. So all that stuff is, uh, is real, and it makes the car so much more beautiful, knowing what's underneath it. One of the first people to drive the new Aston Martin concept was Jacques Nasser, president of the Ford Automotive Group. Well, it was a, just a dramatic shock to me. It was mouth-watering to, to see the tautness of the body and uh, it was parked right beside uh, the DB7, which I think is one of the most wonderful designs uh, on wheels today in the automotive industry. And yet it just made the DB7 look a little soft, uh, not as dramatic as, uh, as I'm used to seeing it. So it was, uh, it was quite a sensation for me to see it, just as we went over the hill and there it was. Uh, in the little uh, parking spot uh, waiting for us. It, it was a wonderful sight. The big news for Merseyside is that Halewood's future is secure after the announcement that the current Ford plant will be refurbished and equipped to produce the new baby Jaguar. Mike Rutherford met up in Detroit with the Jaguar boss to confirm that the plant will be 100% Jaguar. We believe that Jaguars have to be built in Jaguar plants managed by Jaguar people and that is what will happen to Halewood. So it will physically transfer, and if you will, uh, it will be painted green and we'll have leapers all over it, and it will be managed and run by Jaguar people. So no Ford production at Halewood from now on, but oh. the compensation is that there will be Jaguar production. There will be Jaguar production. There will be Ford production until we switch it over, because obviously we're not ready now. And so the Escort will continue, but then it will be superseded by X400 exclusively. We never could have had a Jaguar built in America, could we? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, Jaguars were built in Mexico, believe it or not, up till 1962, and indeed built in South Africa. And what we've got to do is make sure that the business case is right, because if you do something just for emotional reasons, and it really doesn't sustain itself on a business condition, you know you're going to be in trouble in 10 or whatever years into the future. So you've got to make the right business case. That means you're leaving the door open, really, uh, so we won't be surprised in the future if you announce that Jaguar production of one particular Jaguar car, or maybe more than one, will be in the US. I mean, come to think of it, Mercedes are doing it, BMW are doing it, why Abs not you guys? Absolutely. I mean, every everybody said you could never build a Mercedes outside Germany. Well, look at it, and it's a great, great product, and it's being built here in the States. I'm not saying we're going to do it or not going to do it. I just think we should never rule out any option. Environmentalists, legislation and sheer common sense is pressurizing motor manufacturers to come up with cleaner, more efficient methods of powering cars for the future. And now a global alliance to develop fuel cell technology has come about between three leaders in the field, the Ford Motor Company, Daimler-Benz and Ballard Power Systems of Canada. The three companies signed a memorandum of understanding in Stuttgart with a view to working together on this new technology to accelerate its development. We have entered into this agreement with Ballard and Daimler-Benz because the experience and the technology of the three companies in, in fuel cell development is going to be very complementary. Uh, we have believed in Ford for many years that fuel cells is one of the most promising technologies for the 21st century. Uh, we've been working on fuel cells in Ford uh, since at least 1980. We've spent a great deal of, uh, of uh, resources, human resources and, uh, and money on the development. So we think by uh, making this agreement uh, we are going to raise the chances of accelerating the development of vehicles and vehicle systems uh, that use f fuel cells as a power source. Uh, so we just think this is a very promising development uh, and we look forward with a great deal of anticipation to uh, how things work out over the next few years. 
The three companies make the ideal partnership. Ford is highly regarded for its advanced electric vehicle powertrain technology. Daimler-Benz has unique expertise in research into alternative drive systems, and Ballard Power Systems is the world leader in the development of proton exchange membranes. Fuel cells have three key advantages over batteries for electric vehicles. The cells cost less, they don't have the range limitations batteries do, and they don't have the durability limits and replacement costs of battery packs. The main differences are that fuel cells are a lot cleaner, environmentally friendly, they're more efficient, maybe two to three times more efficient than some of the present energy sources. They are uh, quieter because they have no moving parts and they have much lower temperature so the materials that you can use are a lot cheaper and a lot easier to make and finally we think that over a long period of time they will be more competitive because they will last longer. Meanwhile in Detroit, General Motors have announced enhancements to the systems of their electric vehicles, as Ian Royal reports. Now, for some time, General Motors have had a commitment to producing eco-friendly electric cars. And cars like this, which aren't, would you believe, concept cars. They are real cars, and you can see them on the roads of America, particularly in California at this moment. People do use them every day. But one of the worst aspects about having an electric vehicle is of course running out of battery time and that's what General Motors are going to announce today some revolutionary developments in how long you can run an electric vehicle. The breakthrough that we announced yesterday in electric uh, vehicles is that we're introducing the nickel metal hydride batteries this year which will double the range of the vehicles to 160 miles on a charge and that really takes the big problem with with the EV away and that is the fear of not getting home. So with that uh, introduction and with the fact that we're introducing a second generation of electric drive that cuts in cost by a half uh, the electric drive components in the vehicle, uh, we have uh, established a, a much better base uh, going forward for the EV. The EV also serves as a platform to develop uh, hybrid electric vehicles as well as fuel cell electric vehicles. Perhaps for those of us in Britain who, for electric vehicles, is, is a, a, a very revolutionary thing. I mean, it's, it's here in America, but back in Britain, it, there's not a lot of it around. Um, you charge it up at night, you go out in the thing. Are there then charging stations around the area you can, yes. you can recharge? Yes, and of course, it takes quite a while to develop the infrastructure, but there's a lot of work, particularly in California, that is, is putting public uh, charging stations in, in place. Now, we are also introducing a fast charge system that's that's represented over there is called magnet charge and that allows to charge the electric vehicle with lead acid batteries in something like seven and a half minutes and the new nickel metal hydride batteries in 15 minutes so kind of a remarkable breakthrough in how fast you can charge her up again after the break Howard Stableford will be reporting on another alternative fuel, gas, as he drives the new Volvo Bifuel car, only on Motor Week. As we all know, Volvo pride themselves in producing some of the safest cars on the road. The sort of person that buys a car like this is definitely at the sensible end of the market. In fact, I once followed a Volvo in Sweden down a wide open country lane, and when I passed it going about 30 miles an hour, both the driver and the passenger were wearing crash helmets inside the car. So Volvo know their customers are sensible, they're into safety, they probably don't like fox hunting and they certainly don't like what the motor car does to our atmosphere and that's the bandwagon that Volvo have jumped on with this particular car. You see it might look a rather pretty metallic silver but this car is in fact green. It's very green and the clue is in the exhaust <laughs> where the fumes help you breathe more easily. Yes, this is the Volvo S70 Bifuel. Not only does it run off unleaded petrol, it can also be powered by the corpses of ancient marine animals, or 
natural gas to you and me because inside the boot behind the back shelf of the car is one large yellow cylinder. Now that contains 80 litres of compressed natural gas or CNG and can take you about 150 miles between Phillips. So, how do you inflate your Volvo with gas? Well, actually, it's very straightforward. On the other side to the petrol cap is a gas cap. All you do is insert your nozzle. Simple, if you can find somewhere to fill up in the first place. Let's go and try. Right now we're trundling along the old-fashioned way, pumping out petrol exhaust in a built-up area. Now this is exactly the sort of environment that Volvo say we should come clean and go green. And in this car you can at the flick of a switch because the engine immediately then starts burning natural gas. Here we go. What's this horrible little row of green light bulbs down here that look like they've been nicked from a 1970s pocket calculator? Well, this is how you check your gas levels. As the green lights go out, your gas tank runneth empty. Seems to me a bit of a fashion faux pas amongst all this sleek interior styling to have installed a clumsy, chunky light display somewhere down by your left knee where you can't see it, whereas all the other useful dials, the petrol gauge for instance, are exactly where they should be, right in front of you. But that's really just cosmetics, because the switching between the fuels trick is really impressive. It's as smooth as silk. Let's have another listen. Petrol. Gas. Hardly a whisper and no nasty nudges. Well, let's have a look at what's happening underneath the bonnet. The five-cylinder engine is a normally aspirated 2.5-litre with ten valves and four-speed automatic transmission. The air-fuel mix enters the pistons in the normal way. When the engine is first fired up, it always uses petrol, even if natural gas has been selected in the cab. To allow natural gas to be used, there's a supplementary injection system. A microprocessor-controlled fuel distributor supplies the engine with gas via five injection valves, one for each cylinder. And ignition of the gas is regulated and monitored by an advanced electronic engine management system. The gas enters the pistons at a higher compression ratio than petrol. This is to maintain the same power output as the petrol and a smooth transition from one fuel to the other. Any interruption to the supply or damage to a fuel line instantly triggers a cut-off device. And if the car runs out of gas whilst running, well, it simply switches back to petrol automatically. You see, at the moment, there are only 12 places in the country where you can gas up quickly. And if you happen to live in Scotland, Northern Ireland or Wales, forget it. There aren't any. Perhaps they're frightened of leaks in Wales. So, once you have found the gas station, how do you go about filling up? Well, you'll have already set up an account with British Gas. There's no cash needed here, no credit cards. It's billed directly to your home. And they'll have issued you with one of these. It's called a Kiss Key because that's what it does. You lift this flap and kiss the key onto the other end. Gives me a green light and it says, please fuel at pump two. The rest of the process is just like being at a normal petrol station. British Gas say that as demand grows, there will be more gas sites opening up. And to boost that demand, the Bifuel Volvo is really aimed at the fleet market. And actually, you can fill up at home. British Gas will rent out a fuel maker mini compressor for £50 a month, which will replenish your tank slowly over four hours.
But you know, despite the current ridiculous paucity of filling up venues, it's worth remembering that driving on natural gas is cheaper than petrol. It's 42.8 pence per litre, as opposed to anything from 60 to 70p for unleaded. And Volvo clearly feel that they're offering guilt-free driving with this system. According to their statistics, our atmosphere will positively thank us for belching out 25% less carbon dioxide, 60% less carbon monoxide, 85% less nitrous oxides and a whopping 94% fewer hydrocarbons than unleaded petrol. Volvo's commitment to the environment and to telling us about it is real enough. Their glossy brochure talks about cradle-to-grave costs, environmental auditing, chemical blacklists and grey lists that they avoid using, and three-way catalytic converters and the like. If they can solve the filling station problem, then the biofuel deserves to do well. And one thing is for sure, with a car like this, the other man's gas is always greener. <laughs> With sales last year of more than 396,000 new cars and a share of 18.3%, Ford is celebrating UK market leadership for the 21st consecutive year. In fact, the company's performance exceeded the combined sales of the manufacturers ending in the year in third and fourth places in the charts. The country's top-selling car last year was the Ford Fiesta at 119,471, followed closely by the Escort and Mondeo in second and third spots, the fourth year in succession that the trio have swept the board with an impressive hat-trick. And in the important fleet market, which saw sales top 1 million for the first time, Ford was the only manufacturer in the top four to increase its share. The Volkswagen Passat is now available with a 2.8-litre, 193 brake horsepower, 30-valve V6 engine with standard synchro four-wheel drive transmission, making it the fastest main production Volkswagen ever produced. From the spring, the Passat V-engined class will grow when the version powered by a revolutionary V5 unit is launched. This is a 2.3-litre, giving 150 brake horsepower. Both saloon and estate V5 and V6 synchro models will be offered. Prices starting at 21450 on the road for the V5 saloon. And now news of an exclusive MotorWeek competition. Spend a day with the Arrows Grand Prix team. That's the prize in an exclusive MotorWeek competition we're running next week. Go behind the scenes, ask questions, find out what make the arrows tick.